This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 376. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. Hey, everybody, what's going on? It's Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with David Green. What's up, man? You completely blanked on what clever thing to say about me right there, didn't you? No, I didn't. I didn't blank on the clever. I was last time you made fun of me for for oh. always bestowing upon you, uh, like my the my favorites, the temporary co host. So do. I decided to remove host altogether, your co host altogether, and just give you the honor of being David Green. Not David, David. Don't get used to it, Green. Yeah, that's what you're telling me. <laughs> that's pretty much it. How you doing? I'm well, I mean, staying at home, getting work done, kind of fight our way through this this issue, talking about a lot of real estate. I love this kind of stuff because it forces us to dig deeper and look at stuff at a deeper level. And I'm all about that. I like to understand the why of how things work, not just the what. So in a sick way, I kind of like the change that we have going on. All right. Well, yeah, I, I'm a big believer in like that trauma forces change, right? So in terms of like, yeah, uh, you have a heart attack, and you start eating healthier. Uh, or you, you know, you get diagnosed with a disease and then all of a sudden you realize what's important in your life. And so you spend more time with family. So trauma forces change. And I think this is a a giant heart attack for America. And I think if you look at it like that, this is a massive opportunity for growth for the country and for all of us individually. I think, uh, it's not, uh, it's not going to be as bad as I think some people think it is in terms of that. So, I mean, it sucks that people get sick and die. That's going to be horrible, but, uh. But you, yeah. know, you know what? It, it reminds me of 9-11, right? At 9-11, all of the party politics stopped. All the divisions yeah. stopped. Everybody rallied together. You kind of see a lot of that. I mean, other than everybody being mad at other people for buying the toilet paper. Absent <laughs> that, we're all getting along really, really good. So there is good to come out of it. I like that wisdom. And on that there topic, is. we actually have a show today full of wisdom. We do have a show full of wisdom. So today we're talking with a number of different investors and just financial uh, smart people. Uh, who are going to share with their with us their best tip for surviving and thriving in an economic meltdown. And so basically, I just asked a bunch of people that I look up to and trust and value their opinion on what they would suggest for our audience today. And so we're going to go through a lot of them, and then David and I will offer some commentary. And uh, I believe next week, we'll probably be back to the normal interview format here on the podcast. Uh, but we just want to make sure that we're covering this stuff as it's hitting right now. So with that said, let's get to today's quiz. quiz. Tip. Quick tip. Pick up a copy or order your copy of the brand new Bigger Pockets Wealth magazine. That's right. A real magazine, like, like, you know, floppy and sparkly and shiny and all that magazine, like in your hand magazine that Bigger Pockets is launching right now. We're very excited about this. Uh, we've got some really cool stuff in there, including a feature called uh, BP Insights. It's full of data. Uh, like a deep dive into data about the best cash flow markets with low vacancy and high income in 2020. Uh, like the first issue has a ton about recession resistant investing. Uh, there's in a profile of a bunch of different investors, including Joe Asamoah, who is one of my favorite podcast guests we've ever had on talking about how he's in section eight at this time. It's a really smart idea. Uh, you can find that and you can get your subscription at biggerpockets.com slash magazine. That's like 30 bucks for a six issue subscription over the course of a year. So it's super reasonable. Pick up a copy again of yours at biggerpockets.com slash magazine. David, let's get into this thing. You ready? Oh yeah, I'm ready. All right. First clip of today is going to be our good buddy. He was a keynote speaker last year at the BPCon, David Osborne. He is the operating partner at Keller Williams, author of Wealth Can't Wait, co-founder of GoBundance, a tribe of healthy, wealthy, generous men, which both David and I are part of, and just all around like one of the smartest, coolest guys I've ever met. So with that, David Osborne. Write yourself a 10-year vision. Right at the top of the page, it's 2030. My last 10 years have been amazing. My wife and I are getting on better than ever. My health and fitness is incredible. My kids are all doing amazing. My daughter's in college, whatever. Then get into business. You say 10 years ago today, we had this crisis, this coronavirus. The entire economy came to a halt. And I'm so proud of the way I led and the character I developed and the man I became through that time period. I made great decisions. I cut overhead quickly. I preserved cash. And then I took full advantage of the recovery. And because it was such a deep, sharp crash, the recovery was long and lasting. And there was a lot of money to be made. And that's what really made my fortune and helped me get to a whole new level. 
And uh, you remember the, the best thing about a, uh, the worst thing about a boom is that every day you're in a boom, you're one day closer to a crash. Every day you're in a crash, you're one day closer to a boom. And the great thing about right now is we're in a crash. So we're going to ride this thing out and then we're going to ride a big boom into the future. We'll be twice the people, twice the business people we are, twice the men we are or women, stronger fathers, stronger husbands or wives, whatever. And we're going to do all that. And the reason it's valuable to write about your future from today is it puts perspective on it. In 10 years, you won't remember the pain and fear that we're living through today. You'll just remember the abundance that came from it. So good luck. Write your 10-year vision. Basically, the way this format of this show is going to be is we're going to listen to a clip like that. And then we're going to talk about it a little bit, David and I. Uh, I just want to start with just saying, like, I, I had a performance coach tell me this this week as well. He said, looking back, like, do, you want to, do you want to remember this time as something that changed you for the positive or something that you just like squandered your time and you lived in fear? And so that's kind of what I think David is getting at here is like, look, like 10 years from now, like, again, we're not going to remember all the highs and lows and like every little, you know, the daily mundane, like I'm locked in my house. But are we going to look back and say, that was the moment where my life shifted a little bit. You know, it's the whole analogy of a plane taking off. If you just like get one degree off, like 2000 miles later, they're hundreds of miles off course because you just one degree change. So I look at that now. I like the idea of writing, yeah, writing that vision of this is where we're at right now. It's 2030 and this is what my business is like. And it all started back in 2020 because of that uh, crisis. What do you think? What I like was his talk about how cycles are normal. And this is, I mean, that's a really good point. We need to point out to people. Part of my irritation with every time we start to get into a downturn and everyone panics and screams, well, what's the government going to do is that there's this presupposition that you should never have a downturn, but that's not a healthy way to live life. If all you did was work out and you never rested, would you get anywhere? If all you did was work and you never vacationed or vice versa, you vacationed and never worked, would you get anywhere? Life is meant to go up and down. It's totally normal to have a, a time where a business goes great. Then there's a change. Things go bad as we adjust and we learn how to operate under the new normal and then we come back. I mean, if you really just think about the last bubbles we had, the, the last crisis was a lending crisis. We were making loans on real estate and other things in a very stupid way. And we had to pay a price. We had to change. We came back. The dot-com bubble. There was a lot of people that were throwing money into websites and those people made a lot of cash. Then making websites became kind of easy and it wasn't really a big deal anymore. That whole bubble crashed. We wrote it down. We learned. We came back with a new thing. We came back up. It's okay to go through these cycles. It's okay to go through them in your personal life, in your own business life, the economy in general. Don't let yourself start feeling like a victim because we entered into a market cycle that doesn't look like it's as good. Like Dave said, every day that you're in a boom, you're one day closer to a bust. Yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Like this is like when the, the collapse happens, if it does, I mean, maybe real estate is not going to tank like it did last time. Maybe it will. We have no idea. Uh, but we're definitely, uh, the world is going to look very different a month from now, two months from now, six months from now. So in chances are things will look, uh, there'll be a lot of opportunity, I guess, you know, like how many like businesses, like you ever seen those memes, like, I don't know, memes, but like social sharing things of like how many massive businesses came out of recessions, like most of them, like billionaires were made during recessions and business. And, and it's not like, Hey, we're going to go take advantage of the situation, but in a way it's like, yeah, we're going to rise to the occasion and we're going to use this moment because now we're starting from the ground up and we can build again. How many times do you hear uh, people, new investors complaining, well, yeah, it's not easy to find deals anymore. It's not 2007 or eight anymore. Uh, Guess what? Huh? It is 2008 now. Like we're, yeah. we're, we're likely going to be back there. Uh, maybe not again, maybe not as bad, but maybe worse. We don't know, but gear up. You know, this next video that we're about to listen to is a really good example of somebody who went through a downturn in his life to say the least and came out of it much better. Yeah. AJ Osborne, he's a good buddy of mine. And, uh, he is, he has, well, owns a million square foot in self storage. He was on our episode number 286 of the bigger pockets podcast. He's the one, if you guys remember back, his story was where he like woke up one day in a coma or I don't know if you could say woke up in a coma, but his body is basically shut down, but he was awake the whole time. And his like body was on fire for like months and he was awake during the, it was just a tr crazy story. Then he couldn't walk for the longest time, but because the he had a lot system of system was attacking him. That's what it was. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. It was cr like, yeah, it's just like the worst, but because he had all this cash flow coming in from rental properties, he's survived it he thrived he got through it so like from a personal like you know he's got quite the yeah example of, of overcoming that adversity so we're gonna hear from aj now the way that you survive and thrive in economic downturns is by putting other people first let me explain we all of course know cash is king and you want to get rid of bad debt cut expenses increase cash flows but for every entrepreneur and real estate investor what people need during an economic downturn is solutions and lots of times solutions to hard 
emotional problems. It's a time of turmoil and a time that people need someone to step up and lead the way. And this offers very unique opportunities to those that can put others before themselves, for those that can carry the burden, and for those that will step up to the plate. Uh, this was a way that we expanded our portfolio massively and had a lot of wonderful opportunity when working with banks, business owners, and developers as they were trying to solve problems to their real estate crisis that they had in 08. Every crisis is the same. It always, you know, you need to solve complex problems. And by forgetting about yourself and putting other people's first, people remember that it really does come back. And most of the time it comes back tenfold. What, what stands out to me here is this idea of complex problems where the, the economy and the world is changing right now. We're seeing it in massive ways. For example, like David, have you thought about like how many employees now all of a sudden realize they can do their entire job from home? Like uh -huh. that they can now, right? Like, and all of a sudden businesses are like, wait, why are we renting that giant office space that's costing us $40,000 a month when all of our employees actually did just as well working from home? Like, I what wonder if that's going to shift that, things that never used Amazon because they weren't comfortable with the Internet, maybe the older yeah. demographics. And now they're like, oh, it's that easy to order toilet paper. Yeah, I'll totally use Amazon. And now when we come out of this thing, they're not going back to a grocery store as much. It's fascinating. And the idea of like the, the meal delivery stuff, the grub hubs, the like those kind of things the, the uh, like th this is a shift in our society that is being forced upon us. Uh, and I think that thinking that, that these are problems that people are going to have. Like, what do you do with these giant office buildings if they're not going to be there? That's an opportunity maybe for, you know, you to step in and, and lead the way to solve these complex problems. And somebody brought up a great point on the webinar. I did the Bigger Pockets webinar last night. And uh, somebody said, you know, a lot of the the, Ill, the sickness is being spread in these re uh, retirement communities. What do you call them? Like uh, nursing homes, basically, because yeah. everyone's living so close together. Who's going to want to send their parents to a nursing home after this? Just knowing that like disease is part of our life now and officially as like, you know, like this may not be the last one we face. So maybe that's a complex problem that we're going to solve. Like who can solve that problem of like, how do we take care of our elderly, in, like the dramatic amount of elderly people coming out without shoving the people into a giant crowded space that disease just spreads rampantly? Complex problem. What I liked about what he said had to do with the fact that you need to focus on putting others first when you're in a scary time. Because you see a lot of the opposite. Your your animal instincts will tell you self-preserve, buy all of the food, buy all the toilet paper, buy everything you can get, and don't worry about other people. And it, it's in times like this, you have to be extra careful that you don't let your fear turn you into the kind of person that you don't want to be. Like what David Osborne was saying when he said, we should come out as better husbands, better fathers, better business people. Be very aware of the fact your own emotions will be trying to get you to self-preserve because that's always the first instinct we have but we're human beings we're not animals we can override that if we choose to and continue to look for other people and how to help them all right well let's move on to the next one so next we got our buddy tarl yarber so tarl is a regular contributor on the bigger pockets youtube page as well as on our facebook lives on bigger pockets facebook live he runs a big conference out in the pacific northwest uh he's a flipper he's a rental owner he does burr he runs a big meetup uh, he's just a super great guy if you guys don't know tarl you should know tarl but with that, let's hear from Tarl on, uh, on his advice for surviving and or thriving in the economic meltdown. Emotion kills in this business. It has killed us before this crisis, and it will definitely kill us during this crisis. So if you have something that's happening in your business that you feel is out of, out of your control, please stop and think for a second and think about what can you control in this situation. And when something's happening to make you react, think. Make a plan, and when you make that plan, do the math of the plan, mitigate the risk, and measure that risk, and then execute that plan. It's no different than when we invest in real estate every single day. It's no different now and no different in the future. We measure and mitigate risk. So, last thing I want to leave you guys with is that if you're in this business for the long run, this whole time period that's going on right now is just a bump in the road. You're going to look back on the situation, and you're either going to look back and say, hey, I overcame this and I achieved, or I crumbled and I failed. Which one is it going to be? That's up to you. One last thought. Brandon, I love you. Please be my best friend forever. You're going to help me get through this, right? Please save me. Uh, all right. A couple things come to mind real quick. Um, I've been watching a lot of Frozen 2 lately. You watch Frozen 2 yet, David? I know you got uh, you know, I actually did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've been watching so much of it. And there's a scene in there where the snowman, Olaf, is getting like, icicles shoved in his head by a bunch of little kids and he says uh, he's like this is called controlling uh controlling what you can control when you feel out of control or something like that anyway that's basically what tarl's saying here is like there are a lot of things out of control right now so like focusing like 
like Olaf on what you can control. Like here's what, you know, I can't control whether or not my tenants are going to pay rent necessarily, but I can control the letter that I sent them a week beforehand to encourage, to remind them that rent is, you know, still got to be paid. And if they can't pay it, you know, we can, you know, let's, let's have a conversation, keep in contact. So again, those are things I can do rather than just complaining about, you know, what I can't control. My favorite thing is he said is, is isolate the risk, mitigate that risk. That is, man, when you can come to peace with the fact that you cannot get away from risk in life, you'll do so much better. It's always there. We just don't always see it. There's been, you know, right now, do I want to buy? Are prices going to go down more? The risk is they might go down more. If I buy right now, are the tenants going to stop paying rent? That's a risk. Let's say prices drop to 50% of where they are. If you buy now, you're taking a risk because what if they don't go back up? If you buy when they're really high, you're taking a risk because what if I bought at the top of the market? You never get away from risk. Like running away yeah. and hiding from it, just make sure that you never get anything done. You have to learn to flow with it. Like if there wasn't risk, there wouldn't be opportunity. They, they go hand in hand. They have a, what's the opposite of an inverse relationship? What's a fancy word for that? Xverse. <laughs> I think I totally asked the wrong person that question. That's very funny. <laughs> they have a symbiotic relationship. I don't know. When one goes up, the other goes up too. So if you're looking for opportunity by nature, you are also playing around with risk and you have to be okay with it. And he made a really good point. We don't have to hide from risk. We plan for it. We put a contingency in place. We know if, if X happens, I do Y. If A happens, I do B. And we move forward. So good. Yeah. Last thing I'll point out before we move on that he mentioned was like, is con controlling your emotions, right? Like emotion kills, I think is what he said. Like, let's just take like, and realize like when bad things happen like this, like you could just start reacting off like the caveman brain in you. It's like, you know, run, cry, be scared. But I just want to encourage everyone just to like, take a step back and just breathe. And, like, this is fine. We're going to figure this out. This is what we do. This is how we're going to get through it. And, and we're going to solve these complex problems to bring back AJ's thoughts. So yeah, don't let emotion kill you. Take a step back, move forward. All right, time to bring in our next, uh, our next, I guess, guest here today. We kind of divided today's show, by the way, and kind of like, I think three, is it three chunks, four chunks, four chunks. The first one's a lot about mindset stuff. Now we're gonna move into some financial advice uh, from some folks. And so the first guest, it's actually a husband and wife team here we're gonna bring in. You guys know who they are. It's Jay and Wendy Papazan. Uh, you wanna talk about Jay and Wendy because you're the one that first introduced me to Jay. No, I didn't actually. You introduced you? me to Jay. No way. Yeah. But I really wow. like him. It's because I was a Keller Williams guy and Jay's a Keller Williams guy. That's no, I think I, I think that. you introduced me to the concept. I think you introduced me to the concept of Jay. I mean, like who he was, because uh, you said he was like a big deal in Keller Williams, and then I read the one thing. So that's what I. I, I, I like, like that whole like you just create a category if you introduce me to the concept of something. I mean, I could be <laughs> responsible for a lot of introductions from that perspective yeah i introduced you the concept of jay pap is that he's that big of a deal that he actually has his own concept <laughs> he does have his own concept so <laughs> tell us about jay <laughs> jay's awesome man i really like this guy he's becoming a friend and uh i got to meet him with brandon for the first time in austin texas where he lives jay is basically gary keller's uh like number one man he's his right hand man he's at all of the big events that gary does he's uh the co-author of all the books that Keller Williams publishes. They're right behind Bigger Pockets for the top publishing company in real estate. <laughs> I like how you had. They're right behind Bigger Pockets. Right behind us. <laughs> but they're great, right? That just shows we're even greater. I was like, they gave us a compliment without. And let's be, let's be honest, they've actually sold, I think, way more copies of their books than we ever well, that have depends of ours. How but how you track it, right? Currently, we sit ahead of them on Amazon in this very brief moment of time. <laughs> actually, yeah. right now, we don't. Right now, really? Shift, uh, yeah, their book Shift is ahead of us right now. So, I thought that yeah. screenshot you sent me showed I was one, you were two, it and changed. Shift was three. It changed. You didn't have to say that. All right. Well, <laughs> we compete with Keller Williams to be the top publishing company in real estate. Uh, but the reality is, <laughs> Jay's like 100 times better author than me and probably 50 times better yeah. than Brandon. He's a super good author. He writes incredibly good books. I'm yeah, that always book, afraid. The, the one thing is like the book I bring about almost more than anything else. Like he wrote the, he wrote the one thing with Gary Keller and it's phenomenal yeah. life-changing book. When I was on the podcast for the first time, I told people my favorite book was Millionaire Real Estate Agent just because it's so well-written. It's just an incredibly well-written book. And he also wrote Millionaire Real Estate Investor and a lot of the other books that Keller Williams does. His wife, Wendy, runs a really hugely successful real estate team out of Texas with a couple expansion teams. And they're just really good people. I mean, he's the straight shooter. He always, he, he keeps the, the most important thing, the most important thing. He gives terrific advice. He's a very solid guy. It's very hard to meet Jay and not have a lot of respect for him. So every time he talks, I get really quiet. I listen. 
Yeah, agreed. Well, let's hear from Jay and Wendy, which, by the way, they were actually on episode number uh, 113 was the first time that Jay was on the podcast. But then uh, Wendy and Jay together were on the podcast recently. Uh, Wendy, I'm going to find out which one that was. And Jay podcast, Bigger Pockets. I'll tell you what number it was. They were on together on episode 362. Oh, Kevin wrote it right there. I'm blind. All right. With that, let's hear from Jay and Wendy. I think Wendy's first. Our tip today is to cut expenses immediately. And the way that you guys are going to do that is, is you're going to print out three months of your credit card statements and three months of your bank statements. And you're going to do the hard work of going through them line by line. That's right. You're going to categorize it in four ways. There's mission critical expenses, right? This is stuff that you can't live without. There's stuff that you'd really, really like to keep, right? So you're going to hold on to that until you have to. And there's stuff that you absolutely can cut. And you're also going to find a bunch of stuff is like, what the heck is this? And that stuff gets cut immediately. Yep. And you're going to do all that in the next 48 hours, right? You're going to do it in the next 48 hours. And don't forget, queso is always mission critical. Now that's a good tip. (laughs) <laughs> queso is mission critical totally agree Brandon, what's your queso what's like you can't live without it oh man food wise or anything wise yeah any kind of perishable good i'm gonna go with kirkland signature cookie dough protein bars so there's these protein bars from kirkland signature like from costco that are cookie dough and they are probably the best thing in the world in terms of perishable food so don't don't run out costco ever Interesting. What about you? I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that because I didn't have enough time to think of anything that would actually be <laughs> mission critical. Like I just can't do without it. You think about it while we're talking about Wendy and Jay. So their advice, cut out expenses. This is so smart because how many times like over time, like our bank accounts, like there's so many subscription revenue things in the world today, right? Like there's so many things that you add on to your like life that you don't use anymore. Like uh, gym memberships or random like software programs that you bought years ago, especially if you're an investor or an agent or your business person, you probably have a lot in your account. In fact, I wrote a blog post recently, actually like recently, like two years ago, but like it basically said, I found like a hundred thousand dollars hidden in my bank account. And the point I made was when I went to my bank account and I, I did exactly what uh, Wendy and Jay said is like printed out my statement, went line by line through each item. And I found like $180 or something like that worth of stuff that I didn't need. So I canceled it. But if you take 180 times an 8% return over the next like 30 years, it was like a couple hundred grand. And so I make that, that, that point. So yeah, definitely check it out. Um, yeah, you can find more about, I guess, uh, I was gonna say more of like that story and my story with money. Cause I had a, funny money story uh on the bigger pockets money podcast i was show 100 so let's go to biggerpockets.com slash money show 100 as soon as you're done listening to this episode and you can hear my crazy horrible money uh life but uh green what do you think cutting expenses yeah i hate it i don't it's not that i hate cutting expenses i hate taking the time to actually go look at what i'm even doing i think guys like brandon and i we we just despise having to slow down from making money to go look at what we're making but it's i mean every single time you do it, you're like, what, why are we spending money on that? Or are we even getting anything for this? That always comes up all the time. So uh, I hired a guy and he kind of helps runs my finances now, Tanner and Tanner, because I know that I don't do that enough. He looks at it and he gives in front of me and says, why are we spending money on this? Or what's the purpose of, of that? And it, it helps me make sure I'm actually like deducting it as an expense. It's another thing that if we're just being honest, I oftentimes forget to deduct things from an expense. So what I love about doing this is that when you're looking at, you see, most of us make decisions based on emotions. I've talked about that before, but what we're talking about is information. So it gets confusing. Like, okay, I'm looking at all these numbers. How do I know what to do? When you see the big expenses that shouldn't be there, it feels like a punch to your gut and it makes it very easy to get rid of them. When you're not looking at it, it's very easy to just keep paying it. That's why it's easier to spend money on a credit card than with cash. Cause you feel it when it's cash coming out of your wallet. When it's a credit card, there's no emotion tied to it. David, what's your thought on though? It's tough because on one hand we want to cut expenses from our life, but let's just say like one of your, like your expenses are income to somebody else. And during a time like this, like how do you balance that? Like I want to help support other businesses, but at the same time I'm going to cut expenses. So that way like my own life can survive. Like where do you balance that? That's really, really good. Um, I heard somebody one time that talked about how economics professors that are trying to help companies decide how to sell products develop this like made up a concept called a util and a util is a unit of measurement that they would use to determine how much satisfaction somebody gets from something. So what they would say is, okay, when a, how big should we make a Snickers bar? 
Well, the average size of a bite of a human is this big. And the first bite, they'll get 10 utils of satisfaction. They'll love it. The Snickers bar tastes so good. Well, your second bite's maybe like six and a half utils of satisfaction. And the third's maybe four and a half. And at a certain point, it's not really worth the calories that you're taking in to keep eating. So what they would try to do is make a bar only as big enough as they needed to, to maximize how many utils of satisfaction a human being would <laughs> like, they're actually doing studies. That's hilarious to me of like, no. okay, take a bite and write down out of one to 10, how much, how good was that bite? But that concept applies to the question that you're asking right now. You should not be spending money on something that doesn't bring you a, a large return on joy or a return on excitement or make you pumped up to want to go do something more to help your business. So like I fly out there to visit you in Hawaii and that's an expense. But every time I go, I come back and I do more than what I did when I left. That is an investment, even though it's a vacation. There's other things that you do, like, like stopping to buy, like going out to eat when you don't even really want to eat that bad or you're not that hungry or you have food at home. That is a stupid expense. It just doesn't make sense. And, and I would say the same is probably true in the business. I'm happy to spend things uh, on people in my business when they are supporting me and they're bringing me back deals. They're bringing me referrals. They're helping me grow. I will continue to, to spend on those people all the time. If you're someone who's only been taking and not giving, that's where I'm probably going to make my cuts the, the first. Cutting expenses, super important. I'm actually going to do exactly what Wendy suggested. And actually, let's make this a challenge. Let's make this a, a community-wide challenge right now. Do me a favor, guys. Uh, will you leave a comment below the video on YouTube of this episode or in the comments at biggerpockets.com show 376? Let us know how much money you cut from your budget or from, from your uh, expenses uh, on a monthly basis. And let's see who, who can cut the most amount of money from their expenses. So I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to go find out the stuff. I'm going to download my bank statement and go through it just like they said. But here's what I wanted to a, a, a caution people is don't cut stuff that's actually going to make you less money. It's easy to want to go like, oh, I'm going to go cut that thing because it's cost me $100 a month. But you forget like that is actually bringing, for example... Uh, I pay a performance coach. Now, this is not like a guru, like, you know, real estate guru kind of guy, but I pay a performance coach. Every other week we have a conversation. He holds me accountable to all my goals, my plans, whatever. And I've had massive success the last couple of years, largely because of this. His name's Jason. He's awesome. Jason Drees. But, and I know David, you do the same thing. In times of fear, I might say, well, that's a lot of money every month I'm paying. I mean, hundreds of dollars a month. I'm going to cut that. But that would be stupid for me to cut that because that's what actually generates a lot of my revenue is those questions that he asks and those that encouragement. So be careful not to cut things without thinking through, am I actually making more because of this or, or doing better? Yeah, that's great. So look at the return that it's giving you. Don't just look at the expense. I know when I look at my the David Green team's, uh, my, my Keller Williams real estate team's expenses, oftentimes there's a lot of marketing expenses. And like the first thing you want to do is cut those out. But those are the professional pictures and editing that we get done that drives people to the house that helps us to sell it for more money. I could cut that out, but it would hurt my clients so much. Word would get around that we're not selling houses for more than other people and it would hurt the business. So I guess the point I was trying to make, I think you made it better, is cut the stuff that isn't helping you first. If it is helping you, don't just look at what you're saving by cutting it. Look at what you could be losing by cutting it. So speaking of experts, our next guest uh, commentator here is Amanda Hahn. Amanda wrote the book on tax strategies for the savvy real estate investor and the advanced version, which is out right now. Uh, you can get it at biggerpockets.com slash store. So uh, Amanda is actually my personal CPA as well. She's the one that does all my taxes every year. So I decided to reach out and ask what would she recommend? So as some of you might already know, the IRS recently extended both the tax filing and payment deadline from April 15th to July 15th. So we can take our time to capture all of our legitimate tax deductions, and there's not a reason to rush to get the taxes filed by April 15th. Um, of course, if you're expecting a refund, maybe consider filing soon to get that money back into your pocket. You know, now that we have this rare opportunity to take time off from work and stay home to practice social distancing, uh, now is a great time maybe to to take control of your finances. Um, you know, contact your tax advisor, find ways to maximize your tax savings, and also do some proactive planning ahead for 2020 and beyond, right? So read a good book about investing or money raising or tax savings, and uh, don't let this time off go to waste. All right, stay safe, everyone. I love this tip because like, how many times have you ever said, David, because I know I've done it too, it's like, I don't really have time to like dig into like, because I'm so busy, I don't have to dig into like tax strategies and all that. I just kind of want somebody to tell me what to do. But that's like, just like, like, so not extreme ownership. <laughs> like, like, I should like take ownership of my own finances a little bit, and especially when it comes to taxes. So like, I'm not saying I have to be a CPA, but I should know more than I probably do, right? I don't have that excuse right now. 
I can't say, oh, I don't have time. I keep seeing this meme online about like, uh, you know, all the things in life I said I didn't have time for. I now realize I had nothing to do with time because we're still not doing them. Like I'm still not doing my laundry, even though I have all the time in the world to do it. So like, this is such a great opportunity to really brush up on those skills. What I thought when she was talking was it kind kind of came clear to me. The reason that we don't look at our finances or look at our budget very closely when the economy is really good is because we're busy making money. That's offense. We're scoring points, right? Well, now there's not a lot of points to score. There's not as much opportunity. Things have slowed down. Why wouldn't you shift your attention to defense? It doesn't mean do nothing. It just means do what you can do. Now is where we should be cleaning things up and, and improving our systems. I know we're doing a lot of work on our database. So getting that organized, putting plans together so it's easier to stay in touch with past clients assigning new people on my team jobs that they can be doing to help stay in touch with people, hiring new administrators. It's all like kind of defense oriented stuff so that when we do come out of this little uh, recession or pause or whatever you want to call it, we're primed to make uh, more progress faster. Very good advice from Amanda. All right. Well, our next uh, guest today is Brian Burke. So Brian Burke is the CEO of Praxis Capital. He's a syndicator with over $200 million of real estate assets under management, author of an upcoming book, on investing in syndications for bigger pockets, which you'll hear about in the future. And uh, Brian Burke is just a super good guy. He's been on the podcast now, like I think like three times. Uh, I just, uh, I really look up to him a lot. Let's hear what Brian Burke has to say uh, about this crazy time. Before you can thrive in this crisis, you first have to survive it. So first remember, you and your tenants are all in this together. You've gotta be able to work with people and keep as many residents as you can in order to survive through this market. It's gonna be a challenging time for everyone. Uh, but you got to do what you can to work with your tenants. But your lenders might even be working with you. There was just something that came out saying that uh, the agency lenders on multifamily property are going to be doing loan forbearance agreements for a period of time for multifamily owners who are willing to delay evictions from their residents that are affected by the COVID-19 virus situation. So be sure to stay in touch with your lenders, stay in touch with your residents, and you can make it through to the other side. Once you make it through, then you can thrive and uh, take advantage of all that the market's going to offer down the future. Brian Burke is a massively successful real estate investor with a lot of tenants. And he's got kind of the same concerns that I think a lot of us do landlords is what happens if our tenants just don't pay rent. So like you said, we have to survive first before we can thrive. And so the first thing is how do we like hold in our cash and how do we make sure that the tenants still pay rent? Can we work with them? How can we, how many can we keep talk to your banks? Like get that forbearance going. I think it's all really, really good advice. The forbearance thing is super interesting to me. Uh, and we're keeping a close eye on that going forward. It's if, can we spread out our loans? I know there's a, a bill going through the Senate and the House right now that has some provisions on there. If you have like a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan, like on a single family or a small multi, which most people that are in real estate do, uh, that are going to allow for some forbearance options there. So definitely keep an eye on that stuff, you guys. Like this is our job as real estate investors. This is when we have to go to work sometimes. And uh, knowing what changes are coming is a big part of that. What do you think, Green? Yeah, I think forbearance is incredibly smart on behalf of lenders. I was just having a talk with somebody yesterday and he was talking about all the corporate debt and how he's expecting massive companies to just get completely shut down because they can't make their payments. And I was saying to him, if you were a lender and you didn't get your payment for two months or something, would you want to take over an incredibly complex organism like a huge company because they didn't pay you? Would you... Would you want to like foreclose on that company and take it over? Probably not. You don't even know what to do with that thing. You're going to work with them. Maybe you impose penalties because they missed their payment. You, you get some kind of a win somewhere, but you're not just going to want to take the whole thing. And it's very similar to, to lenders right now. They don't want to foreclose on a house that someone just bought a year ago unless they put like 50% down. Most people don't do that. They put down somewhere between 3 and 10% the, the average number of people that are buying a house to live in. Lenders don't want to take those back right now. They're going to give you some time to make those payments. So I think forbearance is very smart. It's one of the reasons I don't think we're going to see, you know, an incredible, incredible buying opportunities just because of this virus. I do think that time will come. I don't think it's going to be, you know, like just flying off the shelves, everything on yeah. clearance like people thought. But this yeah. is better. It's smart. Like there's some flexibility. It's not just you make your payment or you don't. There's a little bit of wiggle room in there. All right. Well, next we're going to bring in. Noah Keg. And so Noah is the founder of AppSumo. Uh, now it's just sumo.com. He was an early employee at Facebook, at Mint, digital marketer, real estate investor. Super great guy. He was on episode, I don't remember, Noah Keg and Bigger Pockets, episode 213 of the Bigger Pockets podcast. Noah's just one of my favorite people in the world and very, very good at business, at both real estate and business. So let's hear what he's got to say. 
What is up, you gorgeous Bigger Pockets members? This is the time that you guys have all been waiting for. We've been sitting on the sidelines waiting for real estate to be an opportunity. And I want to talk about how to survive and thrive during this uncertain times. But here's four things that you can do to be creative and swift in making money during real estate, in my opinion. Number one, how can you get creative in renting your place out? Can you rent it out for short-term offices, packing, distribution, video shoots? If people are doing more things online, maybe they can use it for that. Number two, make crazy low offers. The weird thing about real estate, it doesn't cost you to make any offers. So I've been going out and being like, there's a, there's a lot for sale that's a million dollars nearby where I live. And my buddy's like, let's just offer 850. And I was like, why don't we just offer 700? Like everyone is starting to panic. Like the fear hasn't fully gotten to peak, but it'll happen in the next week or two as everything slows down, as everything closes down. So make crazy offers. Number three, I actually got nervous about making that offer and putting up 700,000 in cash right now. I want to be cash strong uh, so I can take whatever opportunities are coming out there. So I'm hedging it by getting in groups. So if you're thinking about some real estate, you're a little nervous about it because you're not sure if it's still even overvalued or start getting undervalued. Get in a group of four, five, 10 people, use bigger pockets to find a person. Uh, and that's a chance to hedge your risk. And number four, get your renters to prepay you. So if you have any renters in any of your properties, go to them and say 30% off, pay me for the year, then you don't have to worry about your rent, you don't have to worry about your place, and I don't have to worry about any of the money coming in or out. So those are four things you can do real estate right now. The opportunity is in the chaos. You guys got this. All right, so that was Noah Kagan. Again, I, I like this guy because he's super like actionable. Like, do this, do this, do this. Uh, so a couple of his thoughts. Number one, he said, get creative in renting your place out. I, I think that's fantastic. A good example that we were talking with Justin Stamper recently uh, on the podcast, and then I also did like an Instagram live with him. And he talked about how he's renting out his place to traveling nurses right now because he had a bunch of Airbnbs. He couldn't rent them out. So he just went over to the traveling nurses and got them all rented out. And so it's just very smart thinking, how can I get creative on that? So I think that's awesome. And then, of course, making low offers like, there's really no downside to trying it right now. And people like, especially like now they're getting nervous. Like, well, I got to get my money out quick. I got to get this thing before it gets worse. Maybe now's a good time to do that. It doesn't hurt you. What do you think, David? Well, first off, I think I'm the only guy in the world that doesn't know Noah Kagan. Isn't he considered like the top <laughs> networker in the entire universe? Like he he's just a, knows. Everyone. Yeah. You kind of know him through me though. So he's, you know, maybe I'm the network. Six degrees then. of Noah Kagan. Yeah, pretty much. I know the con. I was introduced to the concept <laughs> of Noah Kagan through you, <laughs> but not actually Noah yet. There you go. <laughs> Here, here's what I'm liking about what he's talking about. Uh, well, first off, everybody who hears this advice, it doesn't work in every single market. If you're in my market in the Bay Area and you write a low offer, it probably won't matter. We're still getting multiple offers on houses, even with people that can't see them. Because we were so hot that even though we're cooling, we're not actually cold. Okay. The thing I like about the low offer, even if it's early, which it probably is right now, is just don't make it insulting. Because you're not expecting them to take your offer. What you're opening is a line of communication with that person so that as their fear grows, you're aware of it and you know when they are ready to sell. So don't walk into this like, I'm going to write one offer, swing my ax one time and knock down that tree. Sometimes that works. Most of the time, it's not going to work. You write your offer. You tell them why you want to buy your house. You don't do it in an insulting way. You keep the line of communication open and you check in with them every week. And when they start to get really scared and you're the person who's right in front of them, that's when you're going to go into contract. When we talk about like not insulting them, it's not even just never the, the amount. It can be also just the way you do it. You go and just throw in yeah. a cold offer and don't say anything. Like that's gonna be. But if rude. you include, yeah, kind of rude. Just like if, especially if it's a low offer. But if you go in there with a with a letter or a story or get your agent to butter them up ahead of time or you have that conversation and you find out what they're looking for, where they're at, what they're trying to do with the money. Like now, now you have context to be able to offer a lower amount. So there's a little bit there. Uh, I also really like his advice about investing as a group. I don't think that's a bad idea at all right now. I mean, if you got, you're like, well, I only got 15 grand, nothing I can do in this market. But there's a thousand other people that are listening to this right now who've got 15 grand and not sure what to do with it. You get four of those together to go buy something. Who cares if you're splitting it four ways? You only got 15 grand invested in it. And like, you're going to get, you're going to learn more than like you'll ever make, uh, you know, like the, the point is to learn, not necessarily to make a killing off of it. So. It's a great time to start, you know, getting your feelers out that way. So cool. There you go. All right. Next, let's hear from our friend Brittany Arneson, uh, who was show 320 of the Bigger Pockets podcast. Oh, she and I had a competition of who could get to 100,000 followers on Instagram first. She won. She completely dominated. Uh, and Britt is uh, super, super cool. So let's hear from her on what she recommends at this crazy time. Hi everybody, Britt here. So got the van all packed up, 
ready to go do some self-isolated renovation. Um, and I've been thinking this might be a time where you have to be extra, extra budget conscious. And this is how we've been able to make our renovation the nicest uh, in our area, which in turn gives us the best tenants and saved us a ton of money in the process. So coming up here in these tough times, you might have to start thinking about doing things DIY. You're gonna have these skills forever. It's fun if you could get into it. Um, maybe it's something you need to consider. This is one of those things that like early on in my career, I did a lot of my own work. Uh, and sometimes I say that, you you know, like, like I wish I wouldn't have done so much of my own work. But in reality, the great part about being able to know how to do stuff is that when crap hits the fan, you can go down and start doing your own work. Like, for example, you can start doing your own labor. Potentially, you can start doing your own rehab if you had to in a tough time. You could do your own management if you had to in a tough time. So one of the cool things about just owning real estate is that there's a lot of steps down that you could take as needed. If your cash gets really tight, especially if you're a brand new investor right now and you're struggling, but you own some properties. Yeah, maybe it's time to take it in and just start dealing with it yourself. I don't know. What do you think, David? I know most of your properties are out of state, so obviously you're not going to go in and swing a hammer, but. Yeah, but I started in state and DIY wasn't what was right for me because I had a full time job as a police officer. Uh, but let's talk about the concept because everyone's different. There's some people that like doing it. There's some people that don't. There's some people that can do it. There's some people that can't. Some people are just not physically able to do their own work. Right? They're just not capable of it. They're sick or they have an injury, handicap, anything like that. There, I was talking to the same person I was telling you about yesterday. I was talking about corporate debt falling. And we talked about what I learned be when I became a real estate agent that has nothing to do with selling houses. And really, this is where I learned how to, how to read a profit and loss statement, how I learned how to put a marketing plan together, how I learned how to influence people through sales, uh, how I learned how to build a team, how I learned how to be a leader, how I learned to use a CRM. All of these skills that had nothing to do with selling houses, I learned because I did it. And there's a lot of value in that. So if you're a DIY person, don't look at it just from the perspective of, well, is it cheaper or more expensive? I mean, that's one factor, the financial impact. Would it be cheaper for me to hire someone or cheaper for me to do it? Also look at it from what could I learn from doing this? If you have really low confidence and doing this gives you confidence and it was a good idea that you did it. If it forces your brain to, to work in different ways and solve problems differently than you did before, and you can apply that to whatever you go do in life next, well, then it would make sense that you do it. I don't think it's a bad idea like that Brandon puts together his stools. I mean, I like to tease him about how he does his own stuff because I think that's funny. But Brandon likes doing it. He gets satisfaction from doing it. He gets to go to Heather and he gets to say, look, I did this for you. He gets to feel like a strong caveman that brings home like, <laughs> help. You know, like I just, this deer pelt to give to my wife. Uh, but I have learned to look at the world from if I do this myself, A, is it a, a good business decision? But B, is it a good personal decision? Will it help me in other ways? Good stuff, man. All right. Well, I'm going to go put together a stool. <laughs> All right. Uh, next, Jay Scott, author of the book on flipping houses, host of the Bigger Pockets business podcast, and all around super smart guy. Let's hear what Jay's got to say. Looking for one great tip on what you can be doing right now to prepare for the potential upcoming recession? This is what you should be doing. You should be putting together a fantastic team. One of the biggest difficulties during a downturn is that there are so many opportunities, there are so many potential things that you could be capitalizing on that generally speaking, you're not going to have enough time and energy to do it yourself. So find other people that can help contribute capital to the team, find people that can contribute time, energy, and expertise to the team, find people that are willing to work with you so that when these great opportunities come along, you don't have to pick and choose one or two or three of them. You can do a whole bunch of them because you have a team around you that provides you the capital, the time, the effort, and the expertise to get it all done. So start now putting together that team so when the opportunities start to arise, you can jump on them right away. Yeah, so good. Yeah, this is the time. If you're sitting at home especially, you should be on like – you know, obviously spend time with your family, do that kind of stuff, but like spend time every day on the phone with people, with other investors, find out what they're good at. What do they like doing? What do they get excitement from? Like, what's their thing? So you can start putting together these pieces of like, Hey, what if we just did this together? I mean, this is like the biggest reason that our, uh, you know, open door capital, my mobile home park fund just took off so huge in the last year is because I had like five or six people that are just like rock stars at what they do. And we all just came together. We're like the Avengers and like, we're able to like, you know, defeat Thanos and such. I'm not the analogy guy, David. Give me an analogy. But, yeah, I like it, dude. You, I mean, you're making progress. You all brought right, up thanks, superheroes. Man. Avengers yeah. worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of struggled with what the bad guy would be because you're not really <laughs> defeating anyone. You're raising money. But like, hey, you were really close. I thought thanks, that one was man. pretty good. 
That was like a, that was like a B plus effort right there. All right. <laughs> Uh, I love Jay's advice because it's the same thing that I'm doing. It's harder to find clients to sell houses to, and it's harder to find listings to sell because everyone's wanting to wait and see. So I just shifted and now I'm looking for talent. I'm actively trying to find who would be a good person on my real estate team, who would be a good loan officer, or even learning how to do those jobs that I could bring in, bring into my team and get them trained in this downtime so that when things open up again, they're ready to go. Too many people wait for the opportunity to start preparing for it. It's like waiting for the Olympics before you start working out. You've got four years of time before it's going to start. If you don't take advantage of that time, you're going to lose when the Olympics come. This is a ceasefire. This is a pause. This is an opportunity for all of us to be sharpening our axe. And then when the floodgates open, we're going to go out there and start hacking away again. Yeah, very well put. That was an A- minus effort right there. <laughs> Next. Well, you know what? I have to keep my job, right? You're always telling me in the intro that I might be replaced. So there's a lot of pressure on me to make these analogies good. You got to. I'll find somebody who do a better analogy than you then. Watch out. <laughs> All right. Our next guest today is Lucas Hall, founder of Landlordology, head of industry relations at Cozy. Lucas is a wicked smart landlord, understands a lot of the landlord stuff. And uh, he's got some advice for us. If you're a landlord, listen up. Here we go. So if you're like me, you probably have tenants from all walks of life, some of which are in the hospitality and um, uh, service industry. And some things you can do to help them help you would be one, give them a little more time to pay rent. So most mortgages aren't officially late until the 15th of the month. Maybe you could give them the full 15 days. They would certainly appreciate it and it would increase your chances of actually getting paid. Another thing you can do is give them weekly payments instead of monthly payments. Instead of having a huge chunk called rent due every month, Maybe for the next couple of months, tell them they can pay weekly and maybe they'll be able to pay the smaller, more digestible chunks. And lastly, you could actually credit them the money temporarily. For example, you could say, hey, for the next two months, you only have to pay half rent and we'll make it up later. The worst case scenario, you take it out of their security deposit at the end of the lease. So good luck to you. Keep that cash flow going and I'll see you on the other side. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, like right now, like you got to... Like as landlords, we've got to make sure the cash flow stays up somehow or that we're going to make it through this. Cause like, like, you know, what's that thing you always say, David, about like, uh, like cash flow is a defensive thing. Like it's designed defensive to help metric, us. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so we don't property. lose our properties. Yeah. So if you yeah. lose your property, then it's all over. Right. So, so if you have to, I, I'm not saying that all landlords need to go and just tell other tenants no rent anymore because we still have bills to pay. Uh, even like, they, you know, I put a video out last week on Bigger Pockets that it's over a hundred thousand views now about how I'm going to get, you know, like what happens if my tenants can't pay rent, and it it sparked a massive debate so much that we had to turn off the comments in the YouTube because there were so many like angry tenants that were like, greedy landlords, you should all be just waiving all rent completely until this thing is blown over, and the point I make in that video and then the three follow up videos I've now made since then is like landlords like can't like if we lose our property then tenant you're gonna lose your home anyway eventually like we have to still pay bills the water still has to be paid the garbage has to be paid the the taxes insurance all that and uh so anyway i like lucas's suggestions here i mean he's got some good ideas like the the weekly thing is really interesting to me because of uh unemployment like the big changes they're making in unemployment right now like a lot of our tenants that were out of work are gonna be making like money again but they're gonna be getting checks weekly like a lot of times in terms of unemployment so if you can shift over to that, that might be a good way to help our tenant, but not actually lose any rent. It's interesting. What I liked about it was the breaking it into smaller chunks. Because <clears throat> I think from a psychological perspective, if you're a tenant and your rent is $1,400 a month and you know that you can't pay $1,400 a month, that doesn't mean that you couldn't pay $900 a month. But most tenants are not going to think, well, I'll just pay $900. If I can't pay it, I can't pay all of it. And they don't send you anything. But from the landlord's perspective, you might be happy to get $900 right now and you can figure out the $500 later. Uh, maybe even trade labor or something like that. So if you are take the responsibility to tell the tenant ahead of time, look, I'm going to decrease your rent by this much for the next couple of months. And then I'm going to split it into weekly payments. So now they're only having to pay, you know, 250 bucks a week or something. And that seems more manageable. You can get something coming in and then figure out the difference rather than get nothing coming in. And now you feel like, well, my only option is eviction. Yeah, we're, um, we're doing something similar. What we're going to do in our in our local business, at least out in Washington, and we're doing a version of it in our mobile home park business, is it's not that if they can't pay rent, if they call and say they can't pay rent, this is not what we do. If you want to know more details, check out that video on YouTube, uh, just on youtube.com slash biggerpockets. It's like what to do when tenants can't pay rent. But 
what we're going to do is when they don't pay rent, we're going to first ask, okay, what can you pay? So just like you said, David, and then like if they can pay, hey, if their rent's $1,000, well, I could pay 400. Okay, great. Let's do that. And then the remainder, whatever they can't pay, we're going to divide up over 10 months starting in July. So July through, I think it's the following May or June or whatever the 10 months is. Um, they will pay like 10, basically 10% of the rent extra for those 10 months. So at the end of the year, like a year from now, I will have full rent coming in. But they can basically take the next two months off if they absolutely have to. And we're going to make them fill out a form that says, like, here's why they can't pay. Because I don't want tenants just going, well, you know, I, I didn't lose my job or anything. I'm fine. I just don't want to pay rent because, you know, the economy's you know, or the world's going crazy. I'm just going to be part of the craziness. So we'll make them a- apply for it, so to speak, just to add a, a barrier of entry there. But, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to that's how we're kind of handling at this point. And then with unemployment like kicking in, that should help quite a bit as well. So there we go. Thank you, Lucas. And now on to Aaron Amuchastegui. Boom. Said his last name right, I think, the first time. Is that right? Is that close first enough? First time you've ever said it right. I think yeah, that's the first time that's ever. Extra, I'm extra proud of you because last names are your Thanos. Mm, <laughs> you, you struggle with last names. So Aaron, you know, 200 plus units and just very, very smart when it comes to all things real estate. So with that, let's hear from Aaron uh, to see what he suggests at this time. Right now, if I'm thinking if I can give you one piece of advice on how to survive and thrive during this economic downturn, it would be this. All in one sentence. Don't waste the crisis. Back in 2013, my company had major, major changes. A bunch of people had entered the market. We lost a bunch of cash. Uh, investors lost money. Houses lost money. We were stuck with a bunch of things that we had to deal with. And what I mean when I say don't waste the crisis is you're going to have to have a bunch of uncomfortable conversations with people, sometimes for the first time. You could be telling the bank, hey, I'm not able to make that mortgage payment right now. You could be telling an investor, hey, instead of making money on this one, we're going to lose money. Or instead of making as much money as we did, we're going to make a little bit less. And so when you're having those difficult conversations anyway, you're already telling them something that's a complete bummer. And so take that opportunity to renegotiate the future. You say, hey, sorry, we lost money on this. And actually for the near future, I think it's going to be the same. So now the split needs to be this, this, or this, or, hey, I'm going to miss this mortgage payment. And I actually need a reduction in rate. There's a whole bunch of things you guys can be doing right now. You can go renegotiate lease rates with, with landlords. If you have an office some, somewhere, you could go have the tough conversations with employees. Maybe you need to lay some off. Maybe you need to change the rates with people. Maybe you need to change how much you're paying your contractors, how much you're paying your painters. This is a great time to go out there and say, hey, there's really bad news. We're going to have to do a bunch of things to survive here. And here's the changes we're going to make. Don't waste the crisis. If you're going to have to have a hard conversation anyway, if you're going to have to give somebody bad news, do it now. Do it quicker. If you're going to lay somebody off, do it right away so you can get out there and set yourself up for success in the future. This is hard. Like, I mean, it's good advice, but it's hard. We are going to have hard conversations. I know a lot of real estate investors I've been talking with have already begun laying people off. I mean, there's somebody we just saw in the, in the GoBundance group that laid off like their entire staff. Um, it's, it is a difficult time right now, but we you have to do those things. So, you know, Aaron's advice here is like, look, like use this opportunity to like, you know, ask yourself, like, how can we make this better long term? Like if you're going to rip the bandaid off and have to do something, at least rip the bandit off and, and make it last, like make that stuff last. So if you have to renegotiate stuff, if you have to lower salaries or lay people off, you know, make it count. This is the time to do that. It's hard, but you know, that's what we got to do. Yeah. He, it's really wise that you run at the problem, not away. If you avoid it, if you just say, Oh my God, it's getting bad. And you, you let that paralyze you and you sit at home and you don't talk to anyone. And then you just stop writing checks and you make them call you and say, where's my money? And you go, uh, well, uh, I, the thing is that I, there's no money, right? That's terrible. You want to be like Aaron and, and proactively say, look, we got to figure out a way to make this work. I'm giving you some control over your own fate. If you don't want to work for me anymore, you can find somebody else. If you want to work with me, this is what I can pay you and this is why. Everybody likes to feel like they get a say in what happens. If you just try to impose your will on someone, you're going to work for me at this price or you're fired. They hate that. When you give them an opportunity to choose if they want to you know, partner in it with you, they're going to like it. That's why your idea, Brandon, for how you're going to split up Uh, the rent payments with your tenants, you're giving them this impression or actually the ability to play a part in their own financial well-being. They get to choose, am I going to choose eviction or am I going to choose to work with him? So I really like that idea. We all hate doing it. We never like to have difficult conversations. It's very easy to put them off. But man, every single time that I just shut up and I go do it and I rip off the bandaid, I'm like, that was never as bad as what I was afraid it was going to be. 
Uh, the other thing that I want to point out is that Aaron hosts a podcast called Real Estate Rockstars, and he interviewed Scott Trench on episode 876. He actually went over that with Scott. And uh, uh, let me say that again. He actually interviewed Scott on what makes a good CEO. So Aaron's a smart guy. He talks to smart people for a living and he interviews them like Scott Trench. And I think when he gives advice, I always listen to it because of what he does and the skill he does it at. Yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah, one thing that comes to mind too with this idea of like, if you have to lay people off, maybe a way to like, I mean, laying people off isn't even necessarily the worst thing in the world right now in terms of unemployment kicking in so much. So maybe there is options there. Uh, also, if you're a business owner, there are there are loans and grants coming down from the government here in the next couple of weeks that are going to help us. So make sure you take advantage of those. But what I was going to go with that is like maybe you have an employee that you've been like it's time to let them go. But maybe this is a time to conversation of instead of letting them go entirely, maybe it's time to renegotiate into a commission based or a profit sharing based where like give them the option to step up now because maybe they weren't that great before or maybe you were concerned about them. Maybe now it's say hey, instead of laying them off, it's hey we're gonna I'm still gonna keep you on, but you know you're gonna have to bring deals. You're gonna make ten percent of whatever I make on a flip, or you're gonna make you know a ten thousand dollar finder's fee if you find me a rental property, or you know whatever. Maybe it's the time to do that. It might be a way to 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 shift and to make the change for the future better long term because you're not just thinking right now. So let's get over to our last conversation today with Miss Carol Scott, managing broker of Scott Silver Realty and co-host of the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. Uh, Carol is, of course, married to Jay Scott, and Carol is just one of my favorite people ever. I know I say that about a number of people today, but these are all my favorite people. So uh, Carol is just a wicked smart genius real estate investor, a real estate agent, broker, uh, had a staging company, knows all about business, knows all about so much stuff. So with that, let's hear from Carol. So go and first of all, hug your spouse, your partner, your significant other, and go hug your kids. Why? Because... I really want you to feel the power and the importance of that human connection. That's what we're all craving right now, right? We're told we can't be out there. We can't be social. We can't do those things we're accustomed to doing. So really understand the power of connecting in person and then go pick up the phone. Okay. I'm not talking about sending a bunch of emails. I'm not talking about a bunch of Facebook posts, truly connect with people. So pick up the phone. Call other people in your family that are far away. Call business associates. Call random leads you've had here and there. Not to ask for business leads, not to ask for advice, not to give advice, just to simply ask, how are you doing? How are you coping? Is there any way I can help? And why is this important? Because again, establishing that human connection, especially in a time of need, is so massively powerful. People will remember that. And when it's time to go back to business as usual or to adapt your business, however it's necessary, people are going to remember that you cared enough to pick up the phone, to reach out, to show genuine concern, and to lend a listening ear. So that's my advice. I hope it helps. Now, stop listening to this video. Go pick up the phone and call somebody. That's awesome. Yeah, that's such a great point to end on is that you know, right now we are self-isolating. We're all like self-distancing. And I think people will really respect down the road, especially like remembering that you were there for them in that time that you called them, that you touched base with them. So yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think her advice is, is an amazing idea right now. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking through right now, like who should I pick up the phone and call right now and just have those like meaningful conversations with? Especially if you're a salesperson, this is all that my team and I are doing right now. We're on the phone with people constantly. And it's the same thing we said earlier where, why don't you talk to that person more often? Well, I'm just getting too busy. There's yeah, so much going yeah. on with life. Well, now you don't have that excuse, right? So if you can't invest in real estate or you can't invest in your job, invest in your relationships. This is when you should be talking to people and checking in on them and letting them know you're thinking of them. And, and she made a point that was really wise that they'll remember this more than when you saw them at the birthday party when everybody else was there too, right? That you, check, that you checked in when, they're, when they were most fearful, they were most scared, they were most anxious, and you were a calming presence. People appreciate that. That's kind of what I'm doing all day long. I'm calling clients and I'm calling friends and I'm calling people that refer me business and I'm telling them, it's okay, the world's not going to end. We're gonna be able to adjust to this. We've adjusted to everything before. This is actually a normal part of a business cycle. And I hear the relief in people's voices when we're done. Like I could just feel like all that tension was released. And they're like, oh yeah, you're right. 
the media is playing this up and I'm watching or looking at way too many Facebook posts from people that are not informed and not educated, giving an opinion on something that they don't really understand very much. And it just spins us into this turmoil that isn't really based on anything objective. Yeah, that's such a good point. I hadn't really thought about that, but maybe it's time for us to be like, maybe we need, need to be the hope in other people's lives right now. You know, like, and I'm not saying be false, like, like everything's gonna be fine. I'm not like saying, you know, to everyone, this is gonna be over next week. And, and, but just like, yeah, giving them a break from the constant stream of bad news that they see on their Facebook and on their on you know the news outlets when they're watching them, uh, just as like, hey, here's some really awesome things that are happening right now, and here's something you know ways that we're coming together, and being that person in your family is gonna again pay off long term. They're gonna see you as somebody who's they want to be around, they want to work with, they want to help and support like for the next decade. So yeah, that those relationships pay dividends long term. So build them. All right, man. Well, that was our uh, last discussion today. So with that, I guess we're going to kind of wrap things up and get out of here. Uh, any final thoughts you want to leave people with today as they're going on about their day? Yeah, I really just want to emphasize that there's always positive in any situation. And there's oftentimes more positive in times like this. It doesn't feel that way. But I heard Robert Kiyosaki say in an interview on uh, YouTube last night that the best time to start a business is right after like a crash or in a recession. And and everyone universally agreed the best time to do it is when things are really bad. It might not be the best time to own a business that wasn't prepared for this, but to start one with low overhead, that's the best time. You have to have these ups and downs in order to be able to make money in real estate. If it was just a solid linear process, you would never be able to build wealth quicker than in any other way. So even though this is, things are different and we're having to have different conversations, that doesn't mean it's bad at all. There's a lot of people that own real estate that were never meant to be landlords that shouldn't have been doing it and they're going to get out of the business and there's people that should be landlords they are going to get into it. There's people that um, owned a home and they really weren't responsible and shouldn't own a home and they're going to become tenants and there's people that are tenants that are going to realize like, hey, I don't like this uncertainty. I want to go own a home and house hack. There's people that weren't house hacking that are going to realize I should be house hacking. It'd be nice to have a little bit of extra income, right? We tell our clients all the time, there's a spectrum on one end of it is comfort. And on the other end is profit. You don't get both. If you, I don't want to rent out the rooms in my house. That's okay. You don't have to, but you're not going to make as much money or it's not, or it's gonna be harder to find the right deal. And when things get shaken up like this, all of a sudden not being comfortable doesn't seem so bad anymore. And it leads you, it makes it easier to make good financial decisions because you're not valuing comfort as much when there's so much uncertainty around you. So that's what I want people to be thinking about is how is this forcing them to look at stuff that they wouldn't have looked at that will help them to make changes for the better that they just weren't going to make when everything was good. With that, guys, thank you for listening to our show today. We appreciate you guys a lot. We're going to all get through this. So thank you for, uh, you know, you know, listening, but then like supporting us you know like everybody who leaves reviews that leaves comments that shares us on their facebook for all those things i just thank you guys very much for supporting bigger pockets and supporting david and i we appreciate you guys a lot so thank you and uh final note you know follow bigger pockets wherever if you're not on if you're on facebook and you're not following bigger pockets on facebook do so if you're not following bp on instagram make sure you do that and david is at david green 24 on instagram and i am at beardy brandon beard with a y with that, David, you want to take us out? Yeah. If you guys like this, if you feel good, if you feel empowered, please share it with somebody else because they probably need a little bit of that too. There's a whole lot of negativity going around when you get a ray of light you need to spread it around. So please share the podcast if you really liked it with other people. Uh, and I can't wait to talk to you guys again. This is David Green for Brandon B Plus Analogy Turner signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.